Welcome to Genesis Unleashed, where we unleash the truth of Genesis. And today, ask the question, why are evolutionary just-so stories tolerated? Welcome to Genesis Unleashed. We are on question 12 in the Question Evolution Flyer. Question 12, let's see here. Why is evolutionary just-so storytelling tolerated? Evolutionists often use flexible storytelling to explain observations contrary to evolutionary theory. The NAS and the USA member uh, Dr. Philip Skell wrote, Darwinian explanations for such things are often too supple. Natural selection make, makes humans self-centered and aggressive, except when it makes them altruistic and peaceable. Or, natural selection produces virile men who eagerly spread their seed, except when it prefers men who are faithful protectors and providers. When an explanation is so supple that it can explain any behavior, it is difficult to test it experimentally, much less use it as a catalyst for scientific discovery. Right. And for details on that, you can go to creation.com slash sex stories for more details on this, uh, on this particular question in the 15 questions flyer. I mean, you can see uh, ideas like this in, in, a, in a lot of evolutionary literature. And of course, our creation magazine, we, we try to highlight these things right. just, to, yeah. just to get people to understand that, you know, we're talking about something that supposedly happened in the past. You come up with these stories, but you know, do they really make sense? Um, for example, one of my favorites was uh, in Creation Magazine was Kamikaze Ichthyosaur. Oh yes, that was yes. the title of the article. It was pretty <laughs> good, and uh, of course the what we what the scientist was observing was the fact that there was a an, an ichthyosaur skull, and it was buried. Inverted, right? It was, it was right. standing on the tip of its nose. An ichthyosaur, something like a dolphin. Just imagine a, a dolphin. We think they're they're extinct now, the ichthyosaurus. Yeah. But just imagine a dolphin. It's pretty close. Yeah. So it's standing on its on its snout, and the and the problem for the for the evolutionists was is the the sediments that it was buried in. They had determined that it took about a million years to lay down that sediment. Okay. Which of All course right. is a big problem because that means the tip of its snout got buried a million years before the. The top part of it. So, is the creature going to stand on its nose for a million years as the sediment well, comes up? Is no, it, obviously right? not. No. So, of course, uh, there was a way to explain that. So, what was the evolutionary explanation? Well, they they said that the creature must have been swimming along, and uh, you know, must have died. It must have been very high up, you know, and and then its lungs started filling with water, and then it became heavy. You know, tipped up like this, became heavier and heavier, and went. Mm -hmm. You know, and it's hard not to laugh while while you explain <laughs> this. Like, well, I'm in. It, it it shoved its face through I don't know a meter of sediment or whatever like that. A million years representing of sediment, a million years, yeah, right? Yeah, and, and which was soft, and then suddenly it went hard very very quickly before the thing could rot, and voila, you have a fossil. You you have your explanation yeah. for this dead thing that's buried like that now. The creationist is going to sit there and go, well, wait a sec. That thing must have been buried rapidly. It was probably buried catastrophically. Um, of course, yes. we believe in the flood. Yes. That would be our explanation. You've got a perfect explanation for explaining that. But You're, for the evolutionist, it is a just-so story. Right. It just happened. This is the way it happened. Well, and the thing is, nobody can disprove their explanation, right? I, I right. didn't see the ichthyosaur get buried. Yeah. Nobody saw it. But, I mean, I think we can ask some good questions. I mean... Out of all the snorkeling that's ever been done, you know, and the people going like this, whoa, you know, what was that? You know, look how small anybody, the ichthyosaur. Yeah, is, have you ever seen any kind of creature, you know, just plummet in? Uh, it, yeah, it's it's really, to be honest, to me, it's ridiculous. Even fish would be dangerous. You get a good sized fish. Yeah, but, it, but anyway, it's a it's a just so story, yeah. and it's in the literature. Right? And there's others that we can point to. For example, in 2005, yeah. and 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 since that time. Actually, going back to the 90s, mm. there have been blood vessels and blood cells found in dinosaur bones, Tyrannosaurus mm -hmm. rex bones, and some other dinosaurs as well. Yep. And uh, soft course, tissue. It's soft tissue um, in unfossilized bones, and the story that comes out of some evolutionary, uh, some evolutionists, some of the uh, the science uh, journals suggest that well, now we know that tissue can be preserved for millions of years. <laughs> right. That, it's which a, really it's isn't an explanation. Just so story, right? That isn't even an explanation. 
It's a what? dodge. All, all of these just so stories, are, that, that's ultimately what they are. That's right. I mean, according to Richard Dawkins' uh, selfish gene theory, which he <laughs> puts out in some yes, of his books, right. you know, our genes drive our behavior to maximize our survival. So human males, for example, we're supposed to be more you know, promiscuous, um, you know, by either rape or just plain old promiscuity, right? We're out there, we want to spread our genes, and that's going to, you know, whereas females, they're supposed to be less promiscuous, right? Because they, they want to um, be more like a long-term protector, and they want to, um, because of the, the cost, of course, of bearing children, et cetera, right? Okay, so none of this is, has anything to do with sin or holiness. It's just, uh, it's your genes that, right. that uh, allow you to do these That's things. what they're saying. But okay. the problem is, not all species are like that. For example, the Zeus bug. You can see a picture of the Zeus bug there. It's like a water skater um, right. on the east uh, coast of Australia. It's got a special depression on her back that the male actually uh, sits into when they're, when they're mating. And she carries them around and, and she actually feeds them. She's got the special um, wax secreting gland on the back of her neck. She feeds them. And, and the male, he's you know, half the size. He, he rides around and they mate for up to a week uh, while he's being fed and carried on her back. And um, so... Why this generosity uh, to the male and this, this reversal of roles? Why, why is he just hanging out with her for a week? Why isn't he, you know, out there doing, you know, just meeting with a bunch of females? Why is this special right. yeah. uh, situation here? As a matter of fact, uh, Mark Elger, he's a universe, uh, at the University of Melbourne, explains, a constant stream of suitors wanting to participate in a polygamous free-for-all could possibly lead to greater harassment leading to the female expending more energy and placing herself at a greater risk of harm than if she doted on just one male. While it seems he may be putting his eggs in one basket by remaining faithful, by doing so, he is ensuring that his sperm, rather than his rival sperm, is being used. Wow. So on one hand, evolution explains, uh, the, or, or, or is a justification for, is a re the reason behind going and, and, and spreading as much seed as possible. Male infidelity. Males. Oh yeah, yeah in, infidelity. But on the other hand, it's also the explanation for being a protector and, and staying with one female and, and so on. Interesting. It's, it's so, it's so supple. supple. It, can be, yeah. it can be bent to just about anything, can't it? That's right. Yeah. Which really ends up with not an explanation. Right. So we had some, uh, some attempted answers to this question, these evolutionary just-so stories. Mm -hmm. And uh, here's answer number one. Because evolution's just-so stories are based on facts. <laughs> so why are they tolerated? Because they're based on facts. Well, that's the whole point. <laughs> if they were based on facts, then they wouldn't they be just wouldn't so be stories. Just so stories. <laughs> <laughs> if you could just see, well, the facts just, yeah. I mean, uh, Richard Lewontin, um, an atheist and an evolutionist, he, he had an interesting thing to say uh, <laughs> concerning this. He said, we take the side of science in spite of the patent absurdity of some of its constructs, in spite of its failure to fulfill many of its extravagant promises of health and life, in spite of the tolerance of the scientific community for unsubstantiated just-so stories. Because we have a prior commitment, a commitment to materialism. It's not that the methods and institutions of science somehow compel us to accept a material explanation of the phenomenal world, but on the contrary, we are forced by an a priori adherence to material causes to create an apparatus of investigation and a set of concepts that produce material explanations, no matter how counterintuitive, no matter how mystifying to the uninitiated. Moreover, that materialism is an absolute, for we cannot allow a divine foot in the door. And there's a lot of things we can say about that quote, but... Of course, but he's admitting that science is all... It, it, well, science, he's calling science evolution here, right? right. That's what he's that, calling Yeah, that's... Right? So he's, he's saying evolution, we put up with these just-so stories because we don't want a divine foot in the door. That's basically what he came down yeah, to. Yeah, so we saying. about all conclusions that end up pointing toward or heading in the direction of intelligent designer was there in the beginning. Right, but so if you were on the schoolyard as a kid and the kid said, you know, it's my bat and it's my ball and if you don't want to play my way, you go home. That's basically what he just said to the scientific community. It, it, this is our paradigm and we're playing by these rules and if you don't like it, um, we just don't. That's the end, yeah. yeah. The problem is, is when evolutionary scenarios are full of uh, what if and suppose this and so on, yep. uh, which don't work when a little thought is applied. Um, cons consider Stephen Jay Gould's uh, notion about the fossil record. Right. Of course, he, he was attempting to modify a, or to come up with a new explanation that explains the fossils because of the lack of transitional fossils. And he right. said this, the tale itself illustrates the central fact of the fossil record so well. 
the geologically abrupt origin and subsequent extended stasis of most species, anatomy may fluctuate through time, but the last remnants of a species look pretty much like the first representatives. <laughs> well, there's a big problem for, for Gould, right? He was probably one of the most honest evolutionists I've let, read when I look at the literature. That's what we would think, yeah, that yeah. generally, okay, he's trying to come up with an evolutionary millions of years explanation for a fossil record that shows exactly what, what he just said. That things that don't really change. Things don't change and they're not transitional forms. Yeah. It's a good attempt. So he, so he came up with punctuated equilibrium, of right. course. That things basically stay the same in the fossil record for millions of years, and then they're going to evolve so quickly into something else that you wouldn't see any record in the, fo in the, in the fossils. Right. Which means that the absence of evidence becomes evidence for evolution. <laughs> So, the absence of evidence. Yeah, the, There's the, no data. There are no fossils yeah, there. That, that, that proves evolution. The evidence. Interesting. It, it fits, the whole fossil record fits beautifully with a worldwide flood where evolution didn't happen and it just buried animals that don't change. Which is what but, we uh, see when we look at flood conditions today. That's right. Um, answer number two. I don't understand what this, uh, what this has to do with the theory of evolution being wrong. Well, it, it should be obvious the whole rationale for teaching evolution and excluding any opposition is that it's a tenable scientific theory. Right. It shouldn't need these just-so stories. Those, those explanations should be fact-based. That's, that's the problem. Of course. This question, why are we tolerating these things? I mean, this, this tax attacks pretty well every evolutionary explanation that's out there. There are just-so stories built into pretty well every evolutionary explanation. Oh, you, you find unfossilized blood, blood vessels in dinosaurs? Oh, there's some magical way that they could be, you know, they could just be yeah. preserved for yeah. millions of years. Um, you know, you, you look at a, a fossil of a, of, a, of a creature that's supposedly 100 million years old, and you look at a, a living one today, and there's hardly any change. Well, you know, that, that creature must have been so well adapted to his environment that it didn't need to change, so it, it, it entered into evolutionary stasis. Right, but everything around it that was living at the same time evolved from... Uh, or, into, a, into something massively different. Right. So we can explain why men are monogamous, or we can explain why they cheat, or why they rape. Uh, I can explain how females drive sexual selection, except when it wants to argue when males drive sexual selection. So it's just you just make it up as you go along, whereas what we're talking about, what the Bible had, shows you, is you've got a real history of real events there that you can, you can look at, and then you can go out into the world and you can say, wow, what we see in the world actually matches with what we see in God's world. Right. Um, yep. A word, you, you don't have to make it up, it just fits beautifully. Yeah, we don't have such a, such a supple and flexible uh, notion that the, the, our, what we believe about history is recorded in the Bible. It doesn't change. That's we, right. We can't just go and, and, and modify it. It's right there. The, the, there was a flood. Right. Um, and and that's, we, we can't just bend that around to mean something else, to have some just-so stories. That's right. So, for more information, visit our website, creation.com, and we'll be tackling more of the 15 questions on future programs.